Well, ladies and gents, this is Great Northern War, Class of Kings, Extra History, Part 4, by the channel Extra Credits. Where were we? Oh yeah, Charles was, I think, attacking uh, Russia, invading Russia, just like Napoleon will one day after this. So, Russians are employing same tactics that they will one day with Napoleon. Uh, you know, just retreating back, waiting for the winter, starving uh, the Swedes here. You know, employing somewhat of a scorched earth type of uh, tactics. So, so far, it, it's looking grim for the badass Charles, Charles XII, who's been badass so far. Even though, uh, you know, you could see his youth with some decision. Uh, he's not making some wise decision. He's always just feel out of, ah, I can do this. I got this. That's his mentality. But to his credit, he does got all of them. You know, he did warn everything. Even though any, anything felt like this is ridiculous, he can't win. Even the enemy is like, oh, we don't have to defend that area. No way he's doing this. And he did. And he win. So he's been bad so far. We'll see what happens here. Uh, is he going to win? Or is he going to be the Peter the Great? Who apparently built St. Petersburg. So that's big. So yeah. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards. Please check out the end cards. And yeah, let's always win. Hunger, snow, and fatigue had narrowed all the possibilities of this war down to one stark inevitability. Peter and Charles would meet on the field of battle to decide the fate of the Baltic world. Charles had brought his forces into the Ukraine. He hoped his army would be able to live off the land. More than that, though, he hoped for two great reinforcements. First, he hoped to meet with the supply train that he had opted not to meet up with on the retreat from the Moscow campaign. And second, he hoped to engage Ukrainian Cossacks to serve as his allies. But now, Peter himself was on the field. As the supply column that had been supposed to provide relief to Charles XII turned south to meet with the main army, Peter intercepted it. The initial fighting was fierce. Again, the Swedish army was half the size of the Russian force. But despite this, for a moment, it looked as though they might shatter the Russian forces anyway. This time, though, Peter was with his army, and with him, the hardened elite Russian guard, who stood firm and anchored the wavering line. The fighting turned into a brutal slog. By nightfall, neither side had made any conclusive blow. Both sides withdrew. Yeah, one thing I've been noticing so far in all this war, like even in the Napoleon time and everywhere, if your leader is fierce, somehow, you know, this motivates your soldiers to fight even harder. Maybe there's more to that. Maybe the, you know, the leader also motivates during the war or whatever. But, you know, even in here with the Charles at the helm, the Swedish soldiers are really fierce, even, even though their numbers are really low. And now Peter is there with their, you know, army too, with his elite guards. Now they are fierce too. In the past, usually what happens is, you know, Sw Swedish troops just, you know, just smash through, you know, all the enemy lines. Enemy just gets scared and runs away. Now Peter is there, so I guess the morale is high. They are fighting fierce as well. So it's a hard fight. Through with the setting sun, the Russians to the nearby woods and the Swedes to their defensive position. The Russians settled in to rest, but the Swedes stayed in battle formation, fearing another attack. As the night drew on, though, it became clear that no new attack was coming. So, <laughs> rather than fight against rested and reinforced Russian troops with his exhausted army... <laughs> this goes so with Russian mentality that we know of, right? Ah, everything's gonna be, let's just go to sleep, we'll fight tomorrow. What if the enemy invades? Ah, it's all going to be fine. I react to all this, you know, meanwhile in Russia and, you know, USA versus USSR type of video in that there's always this, you know, ah, there's a, you know, there's a bomb near me. Oh, who cares? It's fine. Smoking cigarette. This is feel like that. <laughs> the Swedish commander ordered a withdrawal under the cover of dark. But as they crossed the muddy ground behind them, the wagons and the artillery began to get stuck, slowing them down. Abandoning some of their artillery and baggage, they managed to make it to the nearest town, but the bridge they needed to truly make their escape had been burnt by a Russian detachment. Seeing this, the men began to panic, but the Swedish commander made the tough choice. They would unload the wagons, carry what supplies they could, and burn the rest. Unfortunately, in these wagons was, amongst other things, the army's alcohol rations. Weeks worth of it. Such a waste. So as the men began to unpack, many of them also took the... <laughs> Do you have food? 
Do we have, you know, grain and whatever, bread and anything? Nah, 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 screw all that. Where's the alcohol? That's the main supply here. Without alcohol, there is no fight. We might, we might as well give up and go home. Where's alcohol? The opportunity to consume the liquor that they would be throwing away. Soon, the army was drunk. Men got lost in the woods. <laughs> Others had to be left You're behind. kidding me. The orderly Swedish retreat dissolved into a chaotic flight. What few men were still good for fighting were given mounts, and these few thousand troops made their escape. No supplies from this caravan would ever find their way to Charles and the Ukraine. Charles's other hope for succor was a man named Ivan Stevanovich Mazepa. Ivan had grown up the bastard son of a minor Polish noble, but as a young page in the Polish court, he had been caught in flagrante with a married nobleman's wife. He had been promptly tarred and feathered, then tied to a horse. With Ivan's face firmly tied to the horse's rear, the horse had been sent packing, running off unguided into the wild. Everyone had expected that Ivan would die on the Ukrainian steppe, but Cossacks had found him, untied him, and gave him a home in their tribe. <laughs> Valorous <laughs> and ambitious, he had risen within their ranks until, when he was 48, the tribe had unanimously elected him to lead them. For years, he had ably served Peter the Great, but secretly, he had always hoped to be free of Peter, to create an independent kingdom for his Cossacks. When Charles had begun rampaging through Poland, Ivan began to negotiate with him. After all, this Swedish king might have a real shot at overthrowing the Russians. Charles never took these overtures too seriously, though, at least not until desperate circumstances forced him to. As his campaign to Moscow began to fall apart, he Why would he? So far he's been, you know, winning, you know, smashing everything. He's a kid, you know, youth mentality. Ah, fuck that. I got this. I don't need no LS. Eh, it's fine. ...considered the value of this Cossack hetman. He agreed that, in exchange for the 30,000 horsemen that Ivan said he had under his command, the Swedes would offer their protection to the Cossacks. It was with the intent to meet up with this force that Charles turned southward. It was for this Cossack force that he abandoned the inebriated and ill-fated resupply train that was originally meant to catch up with him. Charles needed these troops, and the sooner he could link up with them, the better. But Ivan Mazeppa had severely overestimated the Cossacks' loyalty to him. When he made his rebellion known, it was 3,000 Cossacks, not 30,000, that decided to follow him. The rest maintained their allegiance to Peter. Peter then burnt Ivan's capital and sent the bodies of Cossacks tied to crosses floating down the Dnieper to discourage further rebellions. By the Whoa. time Ivan struggled into Charles's camp, he had merely 1,500 men with him and few supplies. Now cut off in the Ukraine, the situation for the Swedish army was... Damn, this is something, right? Peter is going all out. He's like, fuck that. You want to join him? I, I'm, you know, I'm going to make an example out of you. You know, and then, you know, tie to somebody like that and throw it into the river. It, it, so it went from 3,000 now to only 1,500, even half that. That's like nothing in this war. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Was desperate. They were using saltpeter instead of salt to preserve food. They didn't even have enough wine to give the sacrament to dying men. So Charles made a bold plan. He would attack the fortress of Poltava and gain a secure location for his men to rest and await supplies from the rest of his empire. But the privations of the winter had taken an even greater toll on his army. Almost all of his artillery had been left behind, they had almost no shot, and the powder had gotten so damp and waterlogged that men complained that when they fired they could see the balls drop to the ground 30 feet away. They had also lost much of their officer corps, and now that it was summer, gangrene was spreading through the camp. But still, Whoa. they put Poltava to siege. Each day- Alright, now it's just stupid, right? By this point, look, Charles so far has been badass. He's been winning wars, his image is, is of badass throughout Europe, basically. Yes, he, he hit a snafu here and there. He could just retreat back, go to his hometown and prepare and come back with bigger army. He's just keep going here. This, is, this might end really badly because he doesn't even have what he, you know, started with. Now everything's falling out, morale is low, gangrene is there. How the fuck is he going to beat Peter the Great like this? I mean, he has to go back and regroup, I guess. This can't work. Day they tried to mine underneath the fort and use sappers to drop its walls, but without artillery, the going was slow. All the while, Peter raced toward Poltava with a massive relief army. And Seriously. then Charles's legendary luck finally ran out. While overseeing the siege works, a stray bullet caught him in the heel, passing straight Damn. through his foot and embedding itself near his big toe. 
That day, he rode and worked through the pain until his men noticed that he was ghastly pale. When they took him to his tent and cut off his boot, they found that his foot was a wreck. He would have to be carried on a litter for at least the remainder. Ooh, what if he get gangrene too? That's just heft up. ...of the campaign. Then, Peter reached Poltava. His massive army of 80,000 dwarfed the 18,000-ish men of Charles's army that were actually in fighting shape. This giant force arraigned itself in front of the fort and began to dig in. Still, Charles and his commanders chose to rely upon the expedient they had always relied upon. Assault. Yeah, look, Charles has been bad as like I said so far, but Charles is no Napoleon, let's be honest here. Uh, you know, uh, this feels similar to Napoleonic Wars where, you know, it was just, you know, Napoleon was going there and, you know, just losing. First of all, he doesn't have experience of Napoleon, he's young. Second of all, he's not Napoleon. So with 18,000 versus 80,000, Napoleon can pull it off, you know, maybe, even he had to run away from Russians. Charles is not Napoleon, so I guess I can see where this is going. This is gonna end really badly. But if Charles wins, that's gonna be really surprising to me. At first, things go well. Swedes overrun the forward batteries and the assault sweeps forward. But then things begin to bog down. Inopportune orders are given. The Russian line is given time to firm up. Between the men left behind to guard the camp and those ordered to maintain the siege, even while the main fight is going on, the Swedish army is down to about 4,000 men. The Whoa. order is given. They are to rush the entrenched Russian line. Cannon fire rips through the line of charging men. Bullets rain down upon them. By the time they reach the Russian works, nearly half of them lay bleeding on the field. Damn. The king orders his litter raced to the front to encourage his men. One by one, his litter bearers are shot dead around him, until only three of the original 24 remain. The king's litter drops, smashed upon the ground. What few men are left surge forward trying to prevent the Russians from capturing their king. A major rides up, dismounts, and lifts the king onto his own horse, only to be torn to pieces by Cossack sabers moments later. The king is whisked to safety, but at what cost? The army is routed, stumbling back across the steppe, disorganized. They need to cross the Dnieper to escape, but the Russians are fast on their heels. The Swedes are forced to make a difficult decision. The king is sent ahead with 1,500 of the fastest combat-ready cavalry they have left. The remainder of the army is transferred to one of the king's generals. Two days later, with the Russians closing the army's line of retreat, 14,000 of- Yeah, look, I don't want to say this, but, you know, any of you that has been watching my uh, reaction videos, you know that I'm- I have a more ground, you know, realist view of things. So, this was bound to happen, <laughs> right? I mean, he's a kid who, was, who has been high on victories so far. Since has been, he has been badass and his tactics has been fine enough, even though ambitious, he has been winning a lot. So his army is probably like, eh, it, it feels stupid, but maybe he's thinking of something that might give us an edge. But in the end, this was stupid to begin with. He should have retreated back long time ago. But his ego, his childish ego, like, I'm Charles, I got this, was just kept at it until nobody left and he almost got captured and his most of the army died. It's like, you know, uh, giving your 12 year old, uh, you know, uh, drive, you know, giving your 12 year old your car to drive. He drives great, you know, he, he drives perfectly, you know, he, he's, he's perfect everywhere. You're like, fuck that. He can probably race. Now let's put him in the race. And you, you give him the race and then suddenly at first lap he crashes badly. I mean, he's a 12 year old. This is similar to that. He was a 14-year-old when he became king. He has been high on victories. He's very young. You know, he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have that many victories under him. He doesn't have that many years, decades under him that he would be, you know, really smart, you know, tactics-wise. So, you know, this was bound to happen. This this just felt like that, like, you know, yeah, this, this is a disaster. A child led his army into ruins, basically. I, I don't see him rising from this. Even if he wins after this, he still is great after this. His army, his country will still see him as a guy who can easily kill off, you know, his own army because of his stupid decisions. What had once been the world's finest army surrender en masse. Can the king escape? Can the Swedes recover? Join us next week to find out.
Moral of the story is child is a child, regardless of what, doesn't matter how many victories he get, he is still a child. Yeah, 18, 20 year old, whatever, he's a child. You know, there is lots of time like Spanish wars, he had a chance to, you know, make a strategic decision that could favor, you know, his country. He's like, fuck that. Lots of times where he could have made some kind of treaty, fuck that, because he's a child. He was high on his victory. He thought he could dominate the world. Obviously, that's not going to work out. Peter, being older and wiser, obviously, just, you know, used his tactics to, you know, dominate him and it worked. So at first, at the battle, Charles was badass because of his fierceness. More complex tactics uh, came across him and he lost. Scorched of the tech, you know, technique. So his army, you know, his whole army starved. You know, Charles... Uh, uh, Peter did lots of different type of tactics here and there, you know, to use intimidation to Cossacks to kill off his allies. Basically, Peter used, you know, more, you know, grown-up tactics to cross Charles. And, yeah, it worked. Now, I don't know what's going to... Wait a minute, is this the last one? No, there is more past. I don't know what's going to happen now. Is Charles going to learn from this and become even more badass than he was before? Or maybe he's still going to be, you know... A youth type of mentality, ego, and you know, run things to the ground. I guess we'll see. All right, people, that was Great Northern War Class of Kings by the channel Extra Credits. If you like my Rick Sunday and like and subscribe, check out the Rick Sunday. There's a link in the description. Check out the Castle Place, check out the end cards, and yeah, I'll see you next time.